Hello everyone. Schönen guten Abend. Willkommen zur heutigen Artist Lecture. Welcome to the Artist Lecture um, by Mary Mattingly. I'm the curator at Kunst of Wien. My name is Sophie Hasinger. I have the honor to introduce Mary Mattingly to you. Mary, are you here? And can you turn on your video? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Um, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you for joining us from New York City today. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. Perfect. Um, I will introduce you shortly and then I will hand over to you. The lecture will last approxi approximately 45 minutes and then you have um, the chance to ask questions in the chat and I will moderate it after the lecture. Um, Mary Mettingly is uh, part of our current group exhibition at the Kunsthaus called Mining Photography, the Ecological Footprint of Image Production. Part of her series Cobalt is on display in Vienna. Um, Mary, you studied at Pacific Northwest College of Art, at Parsons School of Design, at Yale School of Art. Um, Mary Mettingly is based in Brooklyn, in New York City. And in her work, she explores issues of sustainability, climate change, and displacement. She works in a variety of media. She combines photography, performance, portable architecture, and sculptural living ecosystems. Her artistic practice examines how we can connect and reconnect to Earth and what responsibilities we have um, to our planet. And she's also a messenger for ways we can value the global commons that make up our ecosystem and another foundation of human life, of economy and society. Among many others, uh, Mary is known for installation and community engagement project Swale, a floating food forest on a barge that docks in harbors around New York, or Water Pod, a sustainable sculptural art and technology habitat generating food, water and power in a contained and self-sufficient environment. And we will hear some of that today. Her work has been exhibited internationally, um, to name a few, at Storm King Art Center, at the International Center of Photography, at Seoul Art Center, at the Brooklyn Museum, at Palais de Tokyo. And she has been awarded many grants and fellowships, and her works has been featured in many magazines, such as Aperture, at Art Forum, New York Times, Le Monde, and so on. Um, we're very much looking forward to yet your lecture um, I will hand over to you and um, looking forward to talking a bit after your lecture. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Sophie. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and go to a slide show. And yeah, I, I just want to say that I'm really grateful to be here. Thank you so much for having me and for the opportunity to share some of this work. I wanted to um, share some of my journey in and out and through photography and sculpture and how they intertwine in my work and feed off of each other. And I'll also talk through a few different projects and refer to them as proposals, as you can see, uh, the water pod, as Sophie mentioned, cobalt and swale, and describe basically just how one led to the next. Um, and I wanted to start with what photography is to me right now. It's always changing, of course, um, but it's consistently been, for me, a record of a moment that's been able to um, enter a physical realm, whether that's through a construction or through a fiction or, or through truth. Um, it represents what was, what was seen or unseen. Um, and it also com connects me to um, the complexities and the contradictions that uh, are largely removed from my immediate life, from the supply chains that make it up, um, that are full of toxicities, that are full of um, those complexities that, that usually I usually don't readily see, but I might feel the aftermath of or the health impacts of indirectly. Um, and then the connection that it has to mapping, to colonization, to military and security, those are all um, subjects that are floating around photography. Um, and I find that as a medium, it, really, it continually kind of slides between uh, ethical arguments for and against it. It's at once 
kind of it illuminates uh, social injustices while simultaneously exaggerating them through its uh, chemical footprint. So I, I rely on photography. I rely on it to document sculpture in this case uh, or to share a proposition or a proposal. Um, and, and then finally, to become part of a sculpture. So sculpture and photography are both, in my mind, stages for storytelling. And the dis there's a distinction um, between the two that really can collapse um, in more of a dialogic relationship that I really see as experiential and as durational. Um, they both allow ideas and stories to scale up and down, of course. Uh, so that's kind of the, the place that I'm coming to um, or coming from. And I often focus on, on topics in artwork that revolve around food, shelter, and water, or topics that are really immediate to me. So my camera is a tool that has been a very important investigation. And I learned uh, sewing from my mother, who used to um, make some of my clothes. And my first sculptures were these wearable living units that cleaned water, and they became tense at night. Uh, sketches like that became more complex uh, tent leg uh, suits. Uh, the wearable homes uh, evolved. They had three layers. One was for a desert tundra, one was for an Arctic tundra, and then one was for a, a waterlogged uh, area, which I imagined were the, the future's three most common trains. And I delved into designing this world uh, through photography uh, based on these possible futures. Um, in this image, these people are building islands with tools that are uh, found and remade into uh, what I called island builders. And the wearable homes over time got larger and more absurd. And, and finally, they started to become small ecosystems that were large enough to feel human in scale, but still small enough to comprehend. Uh, you could see things working in these ecosystems. And I think, yeah, so so that's maybe one reason why, and I'll get back to this in more detail, um, I began to appreciate boats as formally. Um, so a boat, I think, maybe more conceptually, can be a proposal for interdependence. It really responds to land in this common space of the water. Um, it's contained, right? So it's um, floating in the water oftentimes, not attached to a dock or a pier. And that way it sort of offers this window in, into this entire living system on a scale that's really possible for people to comprehend and for stewards to easily care for at the same time. So imagine this living system where, where food is growing on board, um, the compost from the food is going into the soil, there are bees, there are potentially um, other livestock like chickens. And and if something is not working, you can sort of identify fairly quickly where, why, and then how to uh, aid it. So this, I think, aside from the formal, the conceptual, uh, has really driven me in this exploration of uh, sculptural living systems and, uh, and the water. And I think one of the really profound things about being able to uh, work with and on uh, the water has been that you re you're really um, also interdependent with other vessels. So uh, you feel your neighbor, for example, you're really in relation with them in this significant way. Um, so after building a story around wearable homes for six years, I envisioned this home in, in the city where I could be maybe less uh, married to this material supply chain. I was dependent on that extracted goods from all around the world, um, you know, funneled them into the city and then, of course, returned the waste to the landfill, sometimes in the, some of the same areas where the goods came from. So I wanted to really embark on a journey of exploration, uh, life art exploration, where I had a sort of a sense of where things were coming from and, and could live uh, in my surroundings in uh, a less... Uh, I guess, harmful way, you know, um, in a way where I was maybe more reliant on what I had around me. Um, so I embarked on this journey. It took three years, uh, and I really wanted to kind of bring people together to figure out how to 
uh, have this work in a dense city, uh, have a space work that could provide clean water, um, be a shelter, and would be made from excess materials and, and people could sort of enter onto and participate in. Um, so like I mentioned, it was a three-year process of partnership building and learning everything from like systems and strategies to really obscure Kafkaesque governmental processes in a litigious city. Um, so I presented this idea to community boards, to businesses, and to individuals before uh, permissions would be potentially granted for each docking location. Uh, so after I, sh I show this image because I think the paperwork was really significant. Uh, after opening this LLC to assume the legal responsibility and then signing a 48 page contract with the city of New York, getting 18 different permits, uh, the water pod would finally be able to launch. Uh, the water pod was, became the name of the project that stuck. Um, and at times I think uh, of, about the importance of these documents, the, these bureaucratic documents that can kind of say much more than a photograph. It can uh, represent years of formal and informal labor and relationship building. Um, it's also almost an artwork. It's a document, uh, an ink drawing, photocopied, stamped, notarized as part of this application process. So I'm trying to see, uh, I'm trying to see some artistry in it, I suppose. But it also led me through these really micro layers and really close looking at systems um, through the paper trail and the, this paperwork process uh, for getting this project to be able to exist in public space for what ended up being only five months, uh, three years of, <laughs> of building up to something that ended up only being able to be in public space for five months. Uh, so maybe zooming back out uh, after building the water pod entirely from the waste chain, it was able to launch in the summer of 2009 and visit 12 public piers in each of the five boroughs of New York. Uh, there's a center 20 foot tall dome that was a public event space and the structure contained these five garden beds around the perimeter, uh, four chickens for eggs, um, rainwater collection, a kitchen, a shower, a gray water purification system for the water that came from the kitchen and the shower uh, to be reused to grow the vegetables. Um, there was a greenhouse that was never finished, four cabins and uh, other systems on board. And, you know, teams complete, completed systems and they were linked together on site by volunteer carpenters and welders. In my mind, the aesthetics were questionable at times, but I think the partnerships were what convinced me of the power of public art to move people and expand through and around uh, different ways of being together. So I lived on the water pod for five months with four friends uh, rotated, who rotated on and off and uh, really worked with the ecosystem at first, spending full days tending to the gardens, but by the end really needing to uh, be there only a few hours, be present with the ecosystems only a few hours a day. Um, and it would provide everything that we needed to live off of. So uh, over the course of this five months, visitors were plentiful. Um, it was complex. There were school groups and open hours and artist residencies that brought people to it. Um, and then we moved off. <laughs> so moving back to land after the water pod, I can say was jarring. I fell back into consumption habits I thought I had left behind. Uh, and this was, uh, this really impacted me, I think, because the water pod did not have a place for um, refuse for the things that people would bring on board and leave on board. We tried to integrate it into the system for a while and it just started looking um, really unship like. <laughs> I can think did not have a place after a while. Um, and I think. You know, I, I realized when I got back to land that I had also been carrying things with me uh, that I was ready to let go of. Uh, so it really took me a couple of years to feel ready or brave enough to make this first bundle, uh, but it was in direct relation to living on the water pod, not having a place for the refuse. Um, and 
I think, you know, being in that situation, it just really asked me to respond to my own desires for consumption and, and the, um, and the questions that I had about, uh, a more remote supply chain with what I realized was very little transparency, uh, to, to then think about what was happening, uh, around me in the city, which I saw at some point as this collaborative, uh, monument making effort, uh, which, which is called the landfill, right? So I was thinking about how, you know, I'm part of this collaboration that's happening around the city and, and we're all contributing to it. And actually we filled it up and now we're moving the, the refuse to other states around New York, sometimes upstate New York, but about five or six other states. And, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just a massive, uh, subject. So I wanted to really visualize a question, how do collections function as, as these monuments to consumption? So when they're wrapped together, they represent their whole, uh, the individual parts are really obscured. Um, and you're left with these very personal monuments to my own excess in this case. And so I did this for a number of years, you know, in the water pod uh, was able to happen in 2009. And finally in 2013, I've accrued um, seven of these bundles, which is almost everything that has been in my possession that I've been able to carry with me, maybe from apartment to apartment. And I've, and I've let it all go, essentially. I've put it, made them into these sculptures. And um, I pulled some of them through New York City to really emphasize, I think, what the objects carried uh, to see to feel the weight, and maybe I can show you a quick image of video of how absurd that really was. I think the, um, the process of getting this bundle to this bridge to walk it over the bridge, uh, and then to realize that it was really too heavy for me to manage without help and without the wheels and um, but the whole uh, piece became, I think, an exercise in absurdity, um, which drew people to the idea and I think opened up conversations and absolutely made me rethink what was in my life. Well, so this, doing these performances uh, led me to, and then and kind of putting everything in bundles, um, led me to, I think, first want to document everything in the bundle before I thought it would be lost to the sculpture. So I devised this website that was based on deep research, but also on fiction. When there were things that I could not uh, find inf information about, I would often um, make it up in a way that was obvious. <laughs> uh, but the project, I think, you know, does, uh, provide a container for a lot of the objects. You know, you can access them through PDFs of the books, uh, 3D images of, of and patterns for clothes, MP3s, and things like that. Um, and yeah, what I learned from this was it was really near impossible to trace the supply chains of the objects that were in my possession. Um, there were so many cloaked exchanges or, you know, just exchanges that people just didn't know the person on the other side. Uh, so there could be a broker and uh, the broker would be working with 10 or 15 different companies. And, and there would really, it seemed be like at least no traceable record for somebody from the outside to, to find and be able to peruse. So I uh, kept some of the things outside of my bundles. I should mention like the, the really things I depended on every day, like my camera, for instance. And I spent a few years making a portrait of it um, based on the mineral makeup of the camera and what I could glean about what was in it uh, from research, often online, but also from calling people and uh, talking with companies and um, going to photo stores, et cetera. And, um, I learned, I, yeah, I learned a lot, but I, I really leaned into the, the deep research about the camera and that work really led me to study cobalt, which is a mineral that's, um, necessary in the camera that I use from the batteries and the lenses that depend on it, um, 
to the electronics. And I was invited to the University of Michigan for this fellowship. And it turned out that um, Eagle Mine, which is in the Upper Peninsula in Michigan, had uh, just reopened as as the one of the first mines in the country to start uh, mining cobalt again after about uh, three decades of not mining it in the United States, mostly because it stopped um, being profitable when it could be mined elsewhere for uh, less money. So this is an image of Eagle Mine in the morning. This is uh, the closest that I was able to get to it. Um, uh, what I learned was that the U.S. military uh, right now is the largest buyer of pure cobalt in the world for uh, mostly for high-grade weapons, and the 63% of cobalt is currently purchased directly and indirectly through the Congo, uh, which deemed it in the U.S. a security risk, and cobalt was reclassified from a conflict mineral to a strategic mineral. Um, so then in this small supply chain, uh, the minerals shipped across the Great Lakes to Sudbury, Canada, where it's smelted into metals and then it's alloyed. Uh, then from Sudbury, it is uh, shipped back. And some of it goes next door to old car factories in Detroit, Michigan, that are now contracting with DARPA to build drones. And it makes sense, and maybe this is where the conjecture comes in, that um, some of these drones would be delivered around the world to different operations and in countries, including the DRC for part of the AFRICOM program that was founded um, by um, when Barack Obama was president in 2007. Uh, so the circuitous, I think, and then reconnecting routes became something that I was learning through and, and struggling with. And I'm gonna skip this video. Um, but, and I'll go to this map that shows how I think complex and decentralized that entire production system is. Uh, and this is specifically looking uh, not at the camera anymore, but a military truck called the light medium tactical vehicle. And the military truck was um, more possible to sort of glean more accurate information about in terms of uh, its, its mineral makeup. And of course, cobalt is uh, an important mineral in, in alloy, in alloyed metals for vehicles like this because of its heat resistance and heat tolerance. Um, so this map is was relevant, I think, for a moment in time. And uh, like I said before, those connections and the, the sort of circuitous routes of extraction are continually changing. And they're changing because I think the world markets and the political situations are fluctuating all the time. Um, so as soon as there's a fluctuation in markets, for instance, um, a buyer would go to another mine, for example, or another processing center, for example. Um, this was research that I did in order to deconstruct the light medium tactical vehicle, which I realized I could um, acquire from a, what's called a boneyard. And a boneyard is where a lot of military equipment goes to after um, after it doesn't work anymore. And this was this boneyard is in New Jersey, uh, and this is what a light medium tactical vehicle looks like as after it's taken apart. Uh, so it's uh, usually about 19,000 pounds and made up of um, lots of what are considered strategic minerals. Uh, this was used in a performance where nine people um, from sound artists, performance artists to veterans re reconfigured it into a stage. Um, in order to really reimagine the ways in which this infrastructure is interconnected with the space itself, and, and this is in downtown Brooklyn, so you can see um, tr trying to make that leap with painting the pillars of the building the same color as the LMTV. Um, and yeah, really thinking about how the vehicle can be re-envisioned to remind of its history. and. Uh, yet like to perform something else. And I am just storytelling through this work. So I think to 
reflect upon that contradiction of my own material use and how dependent I am on the camera for storytelling, I've been trying to image the complexity um, through a more poetic lens. And this is um, an ongoing project uh, where I'm finding cobalt and other minerals that are relevant and making them into these fairly abstract still lives uh, that are complex and, and point to those points along the supply chain that I'm trying to um, envision. And this is specifically the color relating to the color cobalt. And relating to its current prospects, um, so this is one place where uh, companies have wanted to mine it. And then maybe referring to large swaths of land loss that affect, uh, in this case, this is in Florida, uh, they, that affects subsistence farms in Florida. So, um, yeah, so I think these, like I said, become, they sort of become more and more abstract. Yeah, and finally, I, I just wanted to move to plants. I think I use some of the, the same strategies in public art, um, strategies that are more active and maybe less reflective, but they ask for participation and they ask for co-designing and they repurpose the materials in this attempt to transform and complicate their association. So like the light, medium, tactical vehicle, um, thinking through the the first use of these materials, these are IBC totes, and this is um, called Arctic Food Forest in Anchorage, Alaska. IBC totes are used, of course, by the shipping industry. They ship uh, wet goods around the world, or they, they're the container that's uh, most efficient to house wet goods. Uh, and here they are made into small uh, modules for mobile food forests. And Arctic food forest, I think, was a significant shift in my practice because I was thinking about um, assisted plant migration. And this is where I really got to like, work with people who could clarify what that could look like in a near future based on a fossil record. So um, people were already studying what was going to be able to grow in, in Alaska in a near future with climate change and global warming. And this was a project that was really accessible. People could come and pick these plants. Um, most of them were edible and uh, continue a conversation and, and kind of start thinking through farming in a place where um, it's incredibly expensive to purchase food. It all comes in by barge. And um, unless it's subsistence hunting, that's, that's the way that it's accessible. So. Uh, food forestry, being able to farm in Alaska will uh, drastically change things, as crazy as that is to think about, I think, because I associate it with uh, such such difficult temperatures for farming. Um, and then maybe more jarring or more uncanny in my mind, I think, of at least because this is upstate New York and these trees would have never grown there. Um, so these are from agricultural zones nine and 10, and they're brought to Storm King in upstate New York. Uh, they can be missed, I think. They're, there's something that you could gloss over and not notice and come back to and then um, think about, see and think about. Um, this, I learned these trees would be able to survive in 15 years time in this climate, and they're predicted to really be able to thrive in the next 40. And um, of course, that's incredibly speculative, but uh, that's what farmers are sort of moving towards, moving industries for apple and maple north of this area right now. The installation. Yeah, and finally, I wanted to share swale as this intentionally provocative public artwork. It's this floating food forest on a barge uh, that was public from 2016 to the beginning of the pandemic. And it really came out of the water pod and also out of the cobalt project with um, when I had, I think, more clarity on inputs and outputs in a city and the harm that 
those inputs and outputs cause around the world. So unlike industrial agriculture, food forests can grow to be stronger and more plentiful each year. So foraging food from plants grown in New York City's public land has been off limits for almost a century for fear that so many foragers might destroy a fragile ecosystem. And so building this food forest on the water that's connected to public land can follow a different set of rules. It relies upon uh, waterway commons laws and uh, not uh, upon the the legislation that's been imposed on uh, public land in New York City. So Swale was built atop of this 5,000 square foot barge that would, like I said, dock at public piers next to New York City's public land. It would welcome visitors on to harvest these perennial fruits and vegetables and to also care for the space. So it's important to note that in New York City, I think people always say, well, there's there are like a lot of community gardens, so it's already happening. And I think the difference here is that um, this is an expansion of that idea. In New York, there are about 100 acres of community garden space, um, and there are 30,000 acres of public parkland in New York City, and that's really the the land that we could imagine um, on this project uh, that could become uh, forageable land. So it would have another use uh, besides recreation and contemplation. Uh, foraging would provide a lot of uh, the access that I think is is needed uh, for New York City residents. So Swale has followed traditional ecological knowledge and the insights of social scientists like Eleanor Ostrom, who have claimed that in a vibrant commons, people have this vital role to play, not only as beneficiaries of the commons, but also as co-creators and as protectors and as decision makers. So I think, you know, so framing Swale as a, a trial of a commons and a place that is litigious for many good reasons, um, is is something that I think um, gave the team, the Swale team, which was always changing and growing, a lot of agency and also people who came on board who were able to care for and eat from the um, harvest that was at times plentiful and at times slim. Uh, so it was this, I think, it, this exciting space where it was always changing, what was on board was always changing and what was harvestable was always, was not always there. but. Uh, the care was continuous. And I think that's because in part it was different and another part it was really experiential. So young people, for instance, almost always embraced the project first and then they brought their families in. Um, but the experience was maybe from walking onto this barge that is adjacent to a city park uh, and finding that it like looks and smells <laughs> And it tastes like land, if you taste land, but it feels very different. So uh, so you get used to this, this vessel moving back and forth, and uh, slowly your perception starts to shift or your perspective starts to shift. And suddenly it looks like the city is moving back and forth, the skyline's moving back and forth, and the land you're on starts to feel more stable. And I think when you have this perspective shift, if you do, it it can, it can change the way you think about food in general. So I think the questions people asked on Swale started to be asked when, when they're shopping at the store. Um, so I think, yeah, I, so I think about that a lot in terms of uh, how public art can amplify something and how um, working, when people are kind of, co-creating together, it really, um, ideas become really exponential. I just have a few more images of this project. So this is, this is the life of this ongoing project that has been, um, since the pandemic has, um, been closed and is getting ready to reopen in 2024 after a rebuild. Um, and I think maybe the most significant thing that came from Swale is 
um, that in 2017, the New York City Parks Department did open their first land-based pilot, which is a public foodway at a place called Concrete Plant Park in the Bronx. Um, and they've noted that if there is additional interest from residents in stewarding edible plants, that they would consider uh, doing more. This image is really significant. I think that it can sort of re-enliven an imagination of what could be a commons or uh, what could be co-building and supporting commons, uh, something that has to be collective and um, has to be built through conversation, through coalition, and actually also through maintenance, which is something that I'm learning a lot of, about as as I get more and more into these uh, longer term projects, how important that is. And I think I'll stop there. I, I would love to open it up for questions and um, stop sharing my screen and maybe talk about something more in depth. Thank you so much, Mary, um, for your insights and your um, very interesting project um, of, of different kinds. Um, I would like to ask um, all participants and viewers to share their questions to Mary in the chat. It's not possible to turn on your video, but please just write it in the chat and we'll answer it. All right. No questions so far. <laughs> All right. Then I will ask a question. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, um er, the swale project is amazing. I think it's amazing that you kept pushing and really could realize it, but I'm sure um, there was a lot of organizational administrational work to, to implement it. Um, I would like to ask you about, because the, the project was on for four years or so already, yeah. um, maybe also about the, the reactions, you know, at first and how it changed and how the interaction changed um, during the four years, because it is quite a long time. Yeah, so the barge moved mm -hmm. every three or four months. It moved to a different neighborhood. Well, it would go back and forth to the same places, basically. So it would go between Brooklyn and the Bronx and, and an island called Governor's Island. And uh, I think what was really exciting about it was people would plant things. It would come on, come on board, say, in the Bronx. And it was right after planting season and people had things that wouldn't fit on their fire escape or stoop or wherever they were growing. And they would just bring seedlings to swale and they would plant them and they would say, I know this isn't going to be ready for me to eat like tomatoes or something like that, but somebody in Brooklyn is going to eat them. And I'm pretty excited about that. And I think um, the biggest change was in the beginning, it was just growing in. And there was, there were that, because of that, I think there were a lot more access points. Um, people, it wasn't completely full yet. Um, if you look at the pictures in the in the beginning of that project, there are small beds and they're kind of individually planted and it was a hot summer and th things grew slowly that summer. Um, but by the second year, it's really full grown. And I think people were like, oh, there's so much here. I don't know. I really don't know what's edible. And so I think, you know, thinking back I loved that first year because there was a lot of room for inputs from people um, who were suggesting other plants. And by the second year, it was so established. And um, some of the plants were fairly unfamiliar. So people had to be like people were there all the time anyway, but uh, docents had to be there and describe what it, what this was for. <laughs> and um, one of the things I think that also happened the second year that was really important was that we started to ask people what they would prefer uh, what what edible plants 
they would actually pick if they were growing in a public park because that's the year that we knew that it was going to happen. Uh, so 2017 was when Parks Department broke ground on the foodway and we started to ask everybody who came on board, like, what would you actually be interested in eating? And there's so many issues with it. There, There's a, you know, some parts of a plant are not edible and uh, some parks have toxins in the soil. So there are a lot of reasons that 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 law exists at this point, but there are a lot of ways around it. And, um, you know, finding the plants that people actually want to eat is incredibly important for people to care about it. Thank you. Um, I just heard that the chat is not working, but the Q&A is working if anybody has problem. Um, we have two questions already. The first one, are you using traditional methods of developing your images, chemicals, analog, and your thoughts on how you reconcile the making method with the subject, subject of mining and your thoughts moving forward with your photography practice in terms of material, which is, of course, um, the topic of the current exhibition, Mining Photography. Yeah, so I, um, I have been like dabbling in plant-based uh, developing solutions and have tried the caffeinol recipes and things like that. Um, like, I think what's exciting is the like leftover compost that can be made into developer um, fix and fixer with salt has, has kind of worked for me. Um, I, I would say that there's a big uh, gap between what I can get from, from those from the recipes that have been successful for me so far. And um, what I'll call is like the way that I've usually been uh, printing photographs. So I am not printing, <laughs> I'll say. I've been um, taking photographs maybe more judiciously and being a lot more careful about what I print and have been experimenting with print, have experimented with printing, um, but I'm not to a point where I, f where I feel confident um, or happy with the results. And I, I think it's fascinating that they, they won't last that long. And I, and I also struggle with that. So I think there's a, there's that duality that I'm thinking through and struggling through. We have another question. How were Swale and the others funded, both initially and ongoing? Yeah. So. Uh, so the water pod wasn't funded. It was, uh, a, it was, it came together because there were, uh, so many small businesses and people who are willing to, uh, donate objects, uh, the barge in the end, uh, the first barge that we were trying to work with was going to be donated. And the second one we did have to raise some funds for, um, but besides that we were, and how we did that was we had. Uh, sold portfolios of the artwork of the people who were going to be the first residents on the water pod. And, uh, you know, it was, it was fairly nominal. Um, swale was a, was a different thing. It was, it started with a grant from a blade of grass and a Kickstarter campaign uh, where the project raised about $32,000. Um, it was enough to do the build out and to rent the barge for six months. And the people I was working with, um, it was, you know, it was Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice, which uh, was a group that is based in the Bronx. I had met uh, through the water pod. Um, Amanda McDonald Crowley, who's a, a curator and a friend, um, Marissa Preffer, who specializes in plants, uh, and, and many other people. Um, we were, we came to this agreement that. We would give it six months, and if there wasn't support for it after six months, then then that would be it, and we would take everything apart and uh, distribute the plants. And we were able to fundraise and and after it was in place, and keep it going until the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and it was yeah, it was complicated. It was some some individual donors, um, a cider company that did a sponsorship where they did a commercial on Swale, uh, like a television commercial, and they were able to give the money they would have spent on a um, big budget commercial to the project to keep it running for a year. Um, and then there were other small grants that we were 
able to acquire for that time. So yeah, that was completely, completely different scenario. And I think it was because the first one, uh, the water pod was like successful enough. Like nobody got hurt. <laughs> there wasn't a big disaster that happened from it. So it was like a proof of concept for something that could be um, longer term. And the funding for the reopening now to 24? Yeah, so that is, that's in process and we're at the design phase right now. And uh, the plan is to buy the structure outright. So the most expensive part of the project was the rental of the barge for um, for Swale. So what we are working towards is having enough funding to purchase the barge. And then we'll work with um, community groups and the five boroughs uh, to program on board. So it will be... Um, fairly low impact at that point in terms of the finances that we'll need. Another question for you. I'm looking on Swale. Do you see it primarily as an art project or a sociological project? Um, I think, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think like my limited purview, I see almost everything as an art project. Um, I think I saw it as a, it, as a provocation and a way to, at first at least, uh, Swale was a way to um, share with these city agencies the fact that people are really interested and um, together can forage and share the responsibility of, of foraging. And I think, you know, it's sometimes it's contentious to talk about agency, but that's something that I've talked with a lot of people about where people will just say, I feel like this is my neighborhood park and I have no agency. There's nothing I can do here. Um, I can walk through it and sit down and I, can, I have to leave as soon as the sun sets. It doesn't really feel like my park. And um, so I think that that's maybe the sociological part, but I think the, the barge docking next to public land was for me maybe more of a provocation. It became more than that when I learned from it. Um, but yeah, in the beginning I was, I was really thinking about how, um, when people see this can work because people, a lot of people want this to work. Uh, there's a growing movement around access to, to food in New York city. And, um, you know, there will be ways that it will find its way through the cracks. And this is just one small example. And, um, but people over here will do something else and, this will like continue a momentum of food access around the city. And that's really what I, I was thinking about. It's like, how can art be part of coalition building? It can um, use the format of the stage or something like that in order to bring um, attention to an issue. Um, another question concerning the, um, your work in the exhibition at the Kunsthaus. How long did the process to research all mining places for cobalt take? And can you maybe speak about the picture Cobalt Mineral Seep 2016? And if there was a possibility for you to also enter a mining site like Eagle Mine? Yeah, so the closest I could get to Eagle Mine was that image of the forest. Uh, it was funny, as soon as, as anybody gets close to the site, cars come out and they start like following you. So. I did, at the time I hired somebody who had uh, access to a drone. Drones weren't like as widespread in 2016. Um, and they and they photographed it. And I thought that, that there was something maybe cyclical about that relationship of um, cobalt going to Sudbury, then going back to Detroit, some of it being uh, used for the making of drones. And then this person using the drone to photograph Eagle Mine. Um, mineral seep was a was something I saw all over the Upper Peninsula, and um, it's just minerals. <laughs> it's, it's I don't I actually don't I mean it looks like I'm not sure what they are. I don't want to really speculate, but um, maybe yeah maybe that's part of the speculation of the project. The length of time it took to do the research. The first cobalt map I made in. 2016, uh, it was, it took only a few months and that was really, um, associating all of the different uses of cobalt through business to 
um, government and military uh, to um, the individual if you would buy something with cobalt in it as a cleaning product, for example, or as a paint. Um, and the other map, wow, that was like, it took about a year. And like I said, it was only relevant for maybe a couple of months, if even, in terms of its preciseness. I think as the information, I was working with uh, somebody who was helping uh, accrue the data and information because it's really too much for one person. As we would sort of finish one mineral, as we were trying to document the entire LMTV, uh, you know, that would be out, out of date and we'd move on to the next one and be out of date as soon as you recorded it. So um, that was maybe an exercise in futility. And um, for that project, Cobalt, was what, what was the most um, surprising thing you discovered or your most surprising aha experience learning? I'm sure there were quite a few. <laughs> I think it was um, that, this, this sounds really random, but um, it was that all of these car factories are being repurposed to contract with DARPA to build drones in Detroit. I mean, not that many of them, but three. Um, yeah, I think that was incredibly strange to think about. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions for Mary Mattingly? I would like to ask you, um, in the last years, you, you did a lot of um, community projects, a lot of engagement projects. Um, how do you see your role as an artist? Can you still imagine showing in a, just in an exhibition space, in a museum? And how do you see the, the different artworks for a public art project, for a um, community project, and for a work that that is just displayed in a museum? Is it something that is actually still relevant for you? Or do you say, um, let's close the museums, let's just um, do community projects, art projects? Yeah, no, I mean, clearly museums have a big role to play in, in a cultural imaginaries. And um, I think that I'm more of a yes and person. Like I think that every space is relevant and um, I would hate to neglect an entire entire groups of people because I don't get why it's relevant for myself at the moment. I don't know. Like that hasn't really occurred to me that there would be um, one place or another that's uh, less valid to, to share artwork. I can say that what happens when I am able to work in public space is it's uh first it's a huge privilege and second it's like i'm learning so much all the time and that's what's so relevant and exciting about it is the ideas like the project is really alive and it's changing with every person who comes to visit because people have such like contradicting and uh, uh disparate like perspectives on uh some things so i think you know when i think about public art or a community art, I think um, public art really gets to come alive when it's able to change all the time, when it's able to change hands, when it's able to um, be influenced by people who are in and around it. And I think, you know, maybe that's not always been the case for public art. There's a lot of public art that's, uh, of course, supposed to be there permanently and not changed and um, illustrates the time and perspective and and what's more interesting to me is uh, the fluidity with with public space. But I really need both and all. And I'm not, yeah, I'm not, um, I'm very connected to the um, the remnants or, or the way that the story is recorded. So, yeah. Can you tell us something about current projects you're working on, um, except of the reopening of Swale? Yeah, it's yeah. Too early to talk about. No, I would love to talk about. I'm I'm working on a project called the Ebb of a of a Spring Tide that will open at a place called Socrates Sculpture Park in the spring later in the spring, and it's it's very tidal. It's um, a water clock that 
that is influenced by the tides of the East River and it also relies on saline water and and therefore plants that can tolerate uh, saline water. And so that's something that I'm currently in the throes of and what's also like maybe personally exciting besides the exploration of saline farming, which I think is is going to just be more and more relevant uh, with rising sea levels and with inundation from storms and saltwater inundation specifically, uh, is that there will be a, like a living space on in Socrates Sculpture Park that will be like a studio. And the to the person who uh, asked the question about about um, like plant developers or how I'm thinking about that, that there will be a space for those plants um, and Socrates has made a small area for a, as a pinhole camera. So that'll be what I get to do this summer, part of the summer. Yeah. Very excited. So Amazing. Are there any other questions for Mary? Do you have any questions? <laughs> Mary, or um... I mean, I'm I'm incredibly uh, <laughs> curious about people who have who have developed uh, their own images in uh, ways that have worked for them, and yeah, I would love to hear more about that. But maybe it can be. A... <laughs> Wow, okay. If there's no more questions today, tonight, um, I would like to invite everybody, if you have not seen it, to um, look at the exhibition at the Kunsthaus and see Mary's work in Vienna. I'm um, very excited to have the work here and to show the exhibition. Um, and I think the question you also raised with, um, how to produce art sustainable and, um, especially with photography, this is all the big question in the exhibition as well. And we show the, the, the history of the materials basically, which are usually not visible and, um, you make the, um, the, the material cobalt very visible and, um, I think it's um, wonderful how art and your project in this case can really make something that's not or you don't think about it's not visible to really to really map it out in your case and um, it's something I think that that art can fulfill and working with all the data and facts that scientists have um, to to communicate it in a very different way and I think um, your work is is very important. I hope we can have a, a big public art project at some point in Vienna. Um, um, the recording will be available, I believe. My colleague will tell me. Yes, <laughs> you can access it. Um, you can tell everybody about the lecture. And Mary, thank you so much. Um, for giving this Thank lecture, you. for your important work, and um, kind regards um, to New York. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, and, and thanks everybody for the good questions and listening. Thank you very much for all of you who listen to ask questions. Um, the recording will be on Facebook and on our website um, to access. I wish you a wonderful evening and a wonderful afternoon <laughs> in your case. Thank you.